thank you everybody for joining us online and And I will use the microphone now, Travis. Thank you. Father, we just thank you. We give you all the praise and glory and honor. And Lord, we, we ask right now that you would open our hearts, knock off the, the, the places where we think we know things, but they really aren't so because they aren't from you. We ask you to just remove those things from our lives right now. And Lord, we ask too that you would steal our hearts Help us understand what it means to set our faces like flint right now in this time. And Lord, we thank you that your holy fire is surrounding us and you are the glory in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to talk about some controversial things here. Not really, but some people think they're controversial. We're going to talk about the overview of Revelation, we established post-millennial, historic post-millennial. Um, we established historic pre-millennial and talked about the difference between those two belief systems. And here at On Fire Ministries, we are pre-millennial historic folks. Okay. Now, it's okay to have a disagreement on eschatology and still be friends. Amen. All right. But some of the things I'm going to say today are traditionally understood heresies from the early church. And the early church fathers said that at the end, right before the Lord comes back, you're going to see some of these heresies taught inside the church. And some are going to be very obvious and evident outside the church too, but it's going to happen at the same time. So we're going to go through all those. We're going to go through some signs that have been laid out for the end times that we will see in the last times. Again, according to an early church view, okay? So this should be pretty interesting tonight, at least I hope so. But I also want to say that if this challenges you and maybe it offends you, Matthew 18 says, you go to the person that you believe has offended you. The person that has offended you doesn't have an obligation to chase you down. All right? So, hallelujah. And we give an opportunity for that on volunteer night to come reconcile with the pastor. Sometimes there's a line. Hallelujah. All right. So, Revelation chapter 7, we're going to read first. Now, linguistically... This is the place in Scripture where we move from Thalipses or his, the tribulation to wrath. So we see the language begin to change in the original Greek where we shift from tribulation to wrath. Remember, John said at the very beginning, I am a partner with you in tribulation. So the idea that the tribulation is still coming doesn't really make sense because John said, no, I'm actually a partner with it right now. And we look around the world and we see Christians in tribulation or affliction right now, but they're not under wrath. Okay, so we're going to go to Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels. After what? Does anybody remember last week? What did we talk about last week? Seals were broken. What are the seals on? Okay, what were the seals on? On the scroll. What's in the scroll, Demi? What is on the scroll? Why is it important the seals are broken? Are they wraths? See, isn't this interesting? So we had the seals broken by who? Who is opening the scroll? Jesus is opening the scroll. Amen? Each seal is a symbol of authority. It's a symbol of ownership. Some say that that scroll is the title deed to the earth. 
Well, we'll find out, hopefully. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, holding the seal of the living God. And he called out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until, everybody say until, until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Now, there is a huge controversy about this 144,000, all right? Well, we're going to go through it right now. And by the way, you can read this in Ezekiel 9, where in the Spirit, before the judgment of Jerusalem, God sealed the foreheads of his people, and they were the ones that survived. And then he started the judgment at the temple with the oldest first. So Abraham generation, pay attention. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. And from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. And from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all the tribes, peoples, and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. I'm going to stop there for a second. Does that limit it to Pentecostals? Does that limit it to Russians? No. How about Venezuelans? Nope. So it's everybody. All right? So again, when you hear somebody say, well, if you're not part of our church, then you're not saved, you can point them to this verse. All right, hallelujah. Next. Clothed in white robes. Everybody say white robes. Oh, my goodness. And palm branches were in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. If you don't know what to sing or what to worship, you can always turn here. Hallelujah. Then one of the elders responded, saying to me, these who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? And where have they come from? I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. Hmm. They will no longer hunger nor thirst, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to the springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. Well, that's exciting, isn't it? It is to me. So when is this going to happen? When are they going to be sealed? Well, watch this again, just bringing up this from the very beginning. Noah, he's asked by God to build the ark. He gets in the ark. He eats his popcorn, and he's taken out of there. Nope. He is lifted above the earth. Hear me right now. He is lifted above the earth. God's wrath sweeps underneath. And Noah floats away to heaven. Nope. 
he comes back down to the earth. When the wheat is sifted, the wheat is threshed, it is lifted up in the air, and the wind blows away the chaff, and the wheat comes back down to the earth, right? Everybody following right now? Okay. Matthew 13, the fishes are separated. Matthew 25, sheep and the goats are separated. Every time there's a separation, right? But what is taken out by God actually is burned up or is destroyed, okay? He wants to leave his people. And that's clearly the symbol of it. So, Pastor, when are we getting out of here? When's the rapture? Wayne, when is the rapture? Next Tuesday. <laughs> Next Tuesday at 3 o'clock? So, God said we would know the season, but not the day or the hour, right? Now, to refresh your memory, not knowing the day or the hour is talking about a specific day, the Feast of Trumpets. We don't know the day or the hour. We have to have two witnesses to say this is the day. Everybody remember that, right? So this idea that we're not going to know exactly when I don't think it's supported by Scripture, and here's why. When Jesus was born, he's brought into the temple, and he's eight days old. There's people waiting for him. A man, and I love this, oh, so awesome, busts up religious spirits. A man and a woman witnessed that the Christ had been born, right? But they were waiting for him. They were waiting. They were expectant. She was ministering in the temple day and night. One guy was just waiting to die until he saw Jesus, right? Right? So, so they knew it was coming. Well, how did they know? There were signs, God's Holy Spirit. There were multiple witnesses that this was the time. Okay, so watch this. People ask me all the time, and I shouldn't tell it, it's frequent. Pastor, do we know? Do we really know? Am I secure in my salvation? Do we really know? Am I secure? Am I going to go to heaven? Uh, yeah, you are going to go to heaven. Do we really know, though? I, I Minister to the Lord in waiting in expectation. He's going to let us know we're not going to miss it. Hear me right now. I want this is this has got to break through this whole thing. We're not going to miss it. If we're in him and he is in us, we are not going to miss it. It's not going to happen. We're not going to miss it. That's why all these books written about it, is that the mark of the beast? Is that the mark of the beast? Somebody sends me a thing the other day. Did I get the mark of the beast? Because I took this vaccination. I don't know, Pastor. I, ah! Stop. We're not going to miss it. Pay attention to him. Be in him. He's in us. And we're not going to miss it. This is the biggest single point out of this entire time together. We're not going to miss it if we're in him and he is in us. He wants us to know, right? Wouldn't you want? Yes, it's, it's coming. Yes, it's about time. It's coming. Pay attention. All right. So we have several models. This is a premillennial view, okay? In other words, Jesus Christ is coming back before the millennium, and he will rule and reign with us in the millennium. Okay, postmillennial view is he actually comes after the millennium. All millennial view is the millennium is some amorphous thing, whatever, and he comes after. Or somewhere along there. Or we don't know exactly, but it's going to be awesome when he does. Okay? We're in the pre-millennial model right now. We're talking about these things. Okay, so the pre-tribulation model is pre-millennial, Jesus is coming back before the thousand years. But there is going to be a seven-year tribulation, and Jesus is coming back 
before the tribulation starts. But pastor, didn't you say we're already in tribulation? I did. So this has to be a great tribulation then. All right? So at the first. Mid-tribulation is when the abomination of desolation is revealed in the temple, that's when the rapture happens. Okay? The next model is the post-tribulational model. We, we all go through the seven years, and then we're taken up. Now watch this. It seem, might not make sense to you, but follow this. We literally go and meet him in the air. We're transformed, and we come right back down on horses, okay? So it's, it's instantaneous. Our rapture is up and down like that. There's no waiting up there, all right? So the... Pre-wrath model is the first three and a half years of tribulation begins to get worse and worse. Antichrist is revealed. The tribulation gets even worse than that. And sometime during that second three and a half years, we are caught up so we avoid his wrath. Okay? Everybody following right now? So we're not appointed for wrath, so we avoid his wrath. Now this could be any time here, okay? So theologically, this is what the pre-wrath model looks like. False Christ, wars, famines, Antichrist is revealed, abomination of desolation, celestial disturbances, martyrdom happens with the saints, the great tribulation happens, and then at some time... We are resurrected, we are taken up, and then the seven trumpet wrath begins. God's wrath is poured out on the earth, and then we come back down. The, this is Armageddon. We come back down, there's a sheep and goat judgment, and then we rule a thousand years with Jesus. Okay? All right. Wow, I have so many questions, Pastor. Well, somewhere between the sixth and the seventh seal is the rapture. Okay. So, remember last week, 1900 years, the white horse was taught to be Jesus, okay? 1900 years. Taught by Arrhenius, who was the disciple of Polycarp, who was the direct disciple of John, who wrote it, okay? Does it make sense? All right? 1900, or 1,900 years it was taught, right? I showed you how to look at it differently, and I calculated the math out, all right, in present-day value for silver, for a denarius, and showed you that, hey, well, that looks more like it's a protection thing. Yes, some things were going get, to get skewed, but the wine, the blood... The bread, the body, and the oil, the Holy Spirit, were all going to be protected during that time. Okay? Everybody follow this. All right? And we also talked about the fact that the horses in Zechariah were from the Lord. And they were headed toward the enemy in the north. At least most of them. All right. Let me make this very simple then. We're not appointed for wrath. Are there going to be storms coming? Are we going to be shaken? Are we going to know things are getting a little bit closer? I mean, don't you feel it? I mean, Israel and all, you know, I mean, my goodness. But God's going to let us know. We have the 2,000 year timeline that the Jews talked about, early church fathers talked about. I like the pre-wrath model for this simple reason. We're going to be taken up before the wrath. I don't know when that is, but it's going to happen. Okay? And we will be taken up before the wrath. God's wrath will sweep underneath, and we will come back down to the earth to rule and reign with him. It's about, it's about as simple as I can make that. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, there's all of this argument back and forth about... 
the bulls, well, those are also wrath. So you got trumpet wrath, you got bull wrath. Remember what was in the bulls? Anybody remember? Our prayers. Our prayers. Our prayers. Prayers of the saints. Lord, where is your justice? And it's being stored up. Isn't that interesting? It's poured out on the earth. Okay, fine. I get to right here. Well, what about the Jewish people? Are they going to have a revival? Well, Romans 11 says yes. Yeah? So if we, if we start seeing revival happen in Israel, boy, that's another sign something, something's coming. Guess what's happening today in Israel? And just, just an anecdotal, somebody called somebody and said, a Jew, I need to know more about Jesus. Can you tell me more about Jesus? Right. I'm hearing this more and more and more, that there is revival actually building steam. in Israel. Even the rabbis, even the rabbis know that we're close. But they're saying, this is the Messiah, the time of the Messiah, the Messiah is coming. And so I was joking with a guy in an airport, this Jewish man in the airport I met. I prayed for him. He let me pray for him. I prayed for him. And we were joking about this, and I said, yeah, the joke is, you know, Messiah, is this your second or first stop in Jerusalem, right? And, and he kind of laughed at that, and it's true. I mean, this is really what, but we're both going to witness that's the Messiah, which means there's got to be a counterfeit before the real comes. Now, I want you to take this principle for life. There's always a counterfeit right before the real thing comes. And I counsel our young people, there's always the counterfeit spouse. Ooh, right before the real one comes, there's always that counterfeit that's put out right. right now. Looks good. Car, house, everything. There's always this counterfeit put out first, and then the real one comes. Okay, so it's a principle for life, not just eschatology, all right? So we're going to move to the interlude, all right? So we talked about Zechariah 6, 1 through 8, that there is this patrol. Okay, let's, um, Brian, could you go to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4? Keep going. Keep going. The verse 9. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. You shall also tie them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall also write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay. Why don't you read the next verse after that? Then it shall come to pass when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build. Promise of God that is sealed on her forehead. Everybody following me right now. They literally, it's called a phylactery. They put a little box that's tied around their head. They have another one that's on their hand. There's a little leather thing they, they tie. It's on their hand, right? So they, they take this literally, but it's on their forehead. It's sealed on their forehead. It's the law, but watch this. It's sealed there just before... They talk about coming into the promised land and getting the fullness of the inheritance. Everybody follow me right now, okay? So let's hold that thought. Ezekiel 9, six men of judgment, one who seals from the wrath. And they start, these angels start at the temple. Once they've sealed the foreheads of everybody, they start in the temple with the oldest first that should have known better, and they execute judgment on them first in the temple, all right? Uh, Revelation 7, 
The seal is the Spirit. Watch this. We're supposed to worship in spirit and in truth. That's fantastic. Mark, can you go to 2 Corinthians 3.3? 3? by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. We are an epistle. We are a testimony. I love. We are a letter. In fact, if you think about it, we're a love letter. Isn't that cool? We are a love letter. Brian, you are a love letter. All right? I don't know if D sees you that way, but she should. Okay, so... God's seal means not only does it reflect ownership, but it reflects his character. When he stamps something with his seal, it's reflecting his very character in whatever has been stamped, whatever has been sealed. Now, the sealing has happened, and then all of a sudden, judgment is right on the heels of it. Okay? So just like in Deuteronomy, as soon as the seal happens... Judgment happens. Just like in Ezekiel, as soon as the sealing happens, judgment happens right after that. Okay, judgment is wrath. This is a really important point to understand. Evil is already cursed. Everybody following? Evil is already judged. So the judgment, the curse is attached to the evil. And when the evil comes in, the judgment comes in with it. That's why when we let evil come into the country, we let evil come into our lives, judgment comes with it. It's following. It's a, it's a science. It, it follows right after that. And we talked about what that means, war, famine, wild animals. Remember that? Plague. Those four things. So it's very clear that it follows right on the heels. So this makes sense consistently through Scripture. That this is what's happening. All right. Nazarite vow and set apart to the Lord. This is a very interesting thing. I want to go back here real quick. Have sealed the bond servants of God on their foreheads. When he asked, who are these people? Right? And then all these tribes are sealed. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, tribe, and everybody standing in front of the throne. Now, this Nazarite vow set apart to the Lord. We're going to go to, uh, let's see, Larry, can you go to Revelation 14, verse 1? Demi, could you go to Numbers chapter 6, verse 1? The Nazarite vow was a vow that was taken to set apart, to sanctify someone, all right, go ahead. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Keep going. And I heard the sound from heaven, like a roar of rushing waters, and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was, was like that of harpists playing their harps. Keep going. And they sang new of dry grapes. All the days of, the, of his separation, he shall not eat anything that is produced by the grapevine, from the seeds even to the skin. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall pass over his head. He shall be holy until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall let the locks of hair of his head grow long. All the days of his separation to the Lord, he shall not go near to a dead person. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister, when they die, when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days. I'm sorry. Did you say it was where? On his head. Okay, keep going. All the days of his separation, he is holy to the Lord. But if a man dies very suddenly beside him. And he defiles his dedicated head of hair 
Then he shall shave his head on the day when he becomes clean. He shall save it on the seventh day. Then on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest, to the doorway of the tent of meeting. The priest shall offer one for, for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, and make atonement for him concerning his sin because of the dead person. And that same day he shall consecrate his head and shall dedicate to the Lord his days as a Nazarite and shall bring a male lamb a year old for a guilt offering. But the former days will be void because his separation was defiled. Okay, that's good. In short, take the Nazarite vow. You can't drink wine, you can't cut your hair, and you can't touch corpses ever. All right? What's happening in the last times? There's a lot of dead bodies, right? So that's a very fascinating thing. So I want you to watch this. Many people believe that that 144,000 is a Nazarite vow. But it adds one thing to it that's not in the original Nazarite vow that you just heard, Demi read. It adds one thing that is antithetical to Jewish culture. It was hated by Jewish culture, and that is celibacy. Here's why. Genesis 128 says, be fruitful and... Yes, some people's favorite verse. They always quote. They know that <laughs> verse by heart, right? <laughs> oh, let's, let's multiply. Let's go multiply, right? So in Jewish culture, that's what they, they took this like too hard. Like they, you will never violate that. You're not a Jew if you are celibate, okay? So this stands out in Scripture in the last times. Everybody following me because it goes against traditional Jewish culture. Uh, D, can you go to Isaiah 45? And Wayne, can you go to Jeremiah 16.2? So when you get there to Isaiah, go ahead and start. Isaiah 45, verse 18. Meanwhile, Brianna, can you look up Josephus, book 2, chapter 8, section 2? Established it and did not create it as a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no one else. So God is saying, I formed this to be inhabited. In other words, there should be no celibacy. That's the way that the Jewish people think. Okay. Um, you shall not take a wife for yourself, nor have sons or daughters in this place. Okay, read next. For this is what the Lord says concerning the sons and daughters born in this place, and concerning their mothers who give birth to them, and their fathers who father them in this land. They will die of deadly diseases. They will not be mourned or buried. They will be like dominant on the surface of the ground. And they will perish by the sword and famine, and their dead bodies will become food for the birds of the sky. And the wild animals. You hear that judgment right there? All four judgments in one place. The sword, famine, pestilence or plague, and wild animals. Okay? And during that time, they're going to be celibate. So that Jeremiah verse 16, or chapter 16 verse 2, seems to be pointing directly to what is being talked about in Revelation 14. And that there's something very key about this time where people are so. Did you find it, Brianna? Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay, about go ahead. Joseph. Joseph. Well, Je um, section two, Joseph also died. Does that sound right? When he had lived 110 years, having been a man of admirable virtue and conducting all his affairs by the rules of reason and used his authority with moderation which was the cause of his so great felicity among the Egyptians, even when he came from another country, and that in such ill circumstances also, as we have already described. At length his brethren died, 
after they had lived happily in Egypt. Now posterity and sons of these men, after some time, carried their bodies and buried them at Hebron. But as to the bones of Joseph, they carried them into the land of Canaan afterward. When the Hebrews went out of Egypt, um, out of Egypt for so had Joseph made them promise him upon oath. Okay. So we have we have this picture. This is Josephus. It's not in scripture. We have this picture of the the plagues happening. Okay. We have this this picture of Moses, and then we have this picture of Joseph and the saving of the people. We have the picture of passing it on to posterity to the extent that there was a promise and the posterity even took the bones up out of uh, Egypt and buried them in Israel. And the interesting part about this, at least to me, is this posterity that we're talking about right here, the fact that we should have children, the fact that the earth should be inhabited, all of these things, all of a sudden at the end gets stopped. So if we run out of promises of God, we're something else at work here. The Essenes even, the Essenes believed in separating themselves in this way. Again, going against traditional Jewish culture. What about Paul? What happened to Paul's wife? He had to have had a wife if he was a Pharisee. He had to. I mean, that's like with a 99% certainty he had to have had a wife to be a Pharisee. What happened to Paul? Was he separated? Did God separate him out? What happened to his wife? Or did his wife minister to him? Peter had a wife. His wife was there, right? We know that for sure. What happened? Why is this thing about celibacy so important? Why is it standing out right here? Why do you think? No distractions. Very good. No Cleansing. distractions. Cleansing. What's that? Cleansing. Cleansing, but yeah, it, it's it's the spiritual part of it. Yep. Okay, what else? What else do you think? No children. Why but why why would the blessing be taken away? Let me ask it a different way. Did Noah have kids after God told him to build the ark? Let me ask it a different way. <laughs> <laughs> he took his kids with him, right? It took 120 years. So, there's something about the time we're going to know when God, when God is saying, well, it's not that no children are born. Something about hold on that, right? It, there's something about it's going to happen in this time where people are going to be focused on the Lord and they're going to realize, hey, wait a minute. The bigger blessing is coming. That's what I'm focused on right now. There's something about that. And we're going to get, we're going to, get to Ben Azai here in a little bit. But there's something about that. That is is a key indicator to us that something's about to happen. There's something about that. I imagine Noah didn't stop trying. I don't know. I'm serious. But there's something about that part. I don't know what that looks like. But there's something about that pause being put on. Okay. I also find it interesting that COVID didn't really touch the younger generation. It was the older generation that had allowed abortion into America that got touched. 50 years, almost to the day. It's in Rabbi Jonathan Collins' book. So, all right. Let's talk about the order of the tribes. Okay. You guys remember the order that they march out? Dan and Ephraim are left out of this list. Judah and Reuben remain. Watch this. Oh, love this. The serpent, remember, serpent or the eagle, 
serpent is left out, right? The ox is left out. But Jesus and us remain. Isn't that cool? Okay, so let's look at this in depth. Happen. Oh no, Tra Travis. When I when I do that thing, saving onto your it, it it completely destroys my file in here. I don't know why. So I'm gonna we're gonna take a break for about two minutes so I can get reset here. is interesting. There we go. All right, I'm going to back up because I skipped over something. Okay. So just so we were clear on kind of parallels, so this is Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation 6 and 7. So, 4 through 5, Antichrist and False Christ. 6, 7, Wars. 7, Famine. 9, 21 through 22, Martyrdom. 9, 21 through 22, the result of martyrdom. And 20, not verse 29, Celestial Disturbances. 30 through 31, Raptured Saints. And 14, 30, all those ones, Day of the Lord's Wrath. Now, I want to... Just back up for a second. It's interesting. This is the traditional view. So what I taught last time, in 1900 years, they believed that that white horse was Jesus. This is saying, no, actually that white horse is false Christ, comparing or doing the parallel from Matthew 24 to Revelation 6. Okay? You study that on your own, bounce back and forth, check it out for yourself. I don't think that the two things are mutually exclusive. I'll tell you why. How many goats are sacrificed on Yom Kippur? Two. Do they look exactly the same? Yes. One is designated to Yahweh, one is designated to Azazel, right? So, so there are, it's presented almost always together because you have to have God in you and you in God, right, to know the difference between the two the false Christ and the Christ. Amen? Okay. So, sorry, I'm skipped that. Let me go down here. Okay, here's the arrangement in the camp. We talked about that last week. Here's one, this is from Rose's guide, one um, depiction of the order of march out. You'll notice Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan are all on this side as they march out. They're on the left side as they march out. But it's a tribe of Issachar. However, Another one that I found has Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan all on one side as they march out. This seems to make a little bit more sense to me and is more consistent. I find it interesting that they're all on one side, don't you? I also find it interesting that the tabernacle is here, and they're here and here, and these are the two that are left. Ephraim and Dan back here. You follow right here? are not included on the list. So the two that surrounded the tabernacle are left on this list. Now, just a reminder again, Reuben, represented by water. Judah, represented by praise. So interesting, worship and baptism, I love that. Okay, order in which they're sealed. 
Judah, which represents the kingly line, right? Reuben, which represents the firstborn. Everybody following right now? Okay. Gad, who represents the warriors. Asher, who represents the tree of life. Dan is not there. Naphtali, who represents the struggle. Manasseh, who represents, well, Joseph, I guess. Increase and provision. Simeon, which represents hearing and the opening of the gate. Levi, which represents uh, the priesthood, but also that we are connected with the Lord. Issachar, which represents the reward. Zebulun, which represents the dwelling with God. Once again, Joseph, the sheaf of grain, and then Benjamin, that we would sit at his right hand. Now, if I put that together in a sentence, and I'm going to have to do that someday, that's a pretty cool picture of that ceiling that happens with the tribes. All right. Once again, here are the symbols just to show you. I really find this interesting that you have really three of the four horses depicted as symbols for Dan. All right. So, Reuben, the man, and then the tribe of Judah right here, the line of kings. Okay. Next thing, date palm branches. So, we have date palm branches. We're in the robes of righteousness. We have date palm branches. And what we don't get is that part of the ceremony during the Feast of Tabernacles, they would come in the east gate. Now, which gate did Jesus go out? The east gate, right? He walked toward, just finished Passover, sang hymns, and he walked toward the Mount of Olives, which was a prophetic act of pointing toward the Holy Spirit, right? Because olives, olive oil, Holy Spirit. He walks out the east gate. But what they would do is they would have the priest come in the east gate, and they would have these gigantic palm branches, and they would wave them. They were so big, they would wave them. It would create the sound of a rushing wind, which is the Holy Spirit. Okay? They would then have, at the same time, somebody else assigned to take the water, living water, and bring it in, and they would pour it out. And Jesus said, that's me. And the water was called, guess what the water was called? Yeshua. Okay? All right. So when we see the palm branches, the tree of life and victory is what it symbolizes. We've talked about that before. We see this. This is something that is a ceremony that has happened. People celebrate every year. King Solomon's temple had palm trees in it. The triumphal entry, we've already talked about that. Feast of Tabernacles, you can go look there. And in the ancient times, goodness, well-being, grandeur, steadfastness, and victory, Grecian victors would return to their homes waving palm branches. In other words, like the, the ticker tape parades when the soldiers came back from World War II, it was palm branches. That's what they would do as they came back, okay? Vespasian, when, he, when they were conquering the Jews in AD 70 and 71, there's literally a coin and they were mocking the Jews by showing the palm tree, but the Romans had conquered them. Yeah, so much for your victory, right? It was like in your face. Okay. All right. Tribulation. Yeah. Okay. Persecution, affliction, and distress. Which is large in the widest sense. Kino which is dwell with. So, Jesus will dwell with his people. Zoes, okay, living, physical, and spiritual, present and future, shepherd, guide, tend, uh, govern, and feed and defend. All right, so let me talk about this. This right here, these are words that are translated in Revelation that throw a lot of people off. This is, again, translated as what? Tribulation. Megalus sometimes is translated as 
great tribulation, all right? I'm going to just kind of camp here for a second. When we see this shift to orgies in Revelation, we know that we're coming into the time of God's wrath. All right. Expectant, not imminent. Everybody say expectant, not imminent. Expectant, not imminent. Okay. <coughs> Whoever wants to, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse one. Concerning the coming of Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by a word of mouth or by letter, asserting that day of the Lord has already come. Okay, stop right there. Asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. And there are some people who teach that right now, that the day of the Lord has already come, it's already passed. Keep going. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. <coughs> Our Okay, so, if we start to see these things, then it's imminent. Otherwise, we're expectant. Everybody get that? Okay, so, apostasy and the man of lawlessness is revealed. There is this whole thing that we will not face the Antichrist. That goes against all of the early church fathers, okay? All of the early church fathers taught that the church would face the Antichrist. And it is taught in, in what is the earliest known list of Christian theology called the Didache, D-I-D-A-C-H-E. You can read it in there. That we, as the church, would face the Antichrist. All the early church fathers taught this. So, if we see apostasy happen, and we see the man of lawlessness revealed, now it's imminent. But until then, it's not imminent. A couple other signs. There will be celestial disturbances. Hmm, that's actually kind of happening a little bit. It's a little bit, okay? Elijah, or somebody moving in the spirit and power of Elijah comes. Well, we haven't seen somebody like that yet that, I, that really like resonates with me. Remember, we're not going to miss this. Okay, so just stop for a second, and let's just take a, a practical... Recent event. I knew I was in the right place, and a lot of people came to the church and knew they were in the right place because we weren't doing the mask thing, right? It resonated in your heart, right? No. And oh, by the way, I'm not going to take the vaccine. No, I'm not going to do that. And all of a sudden, all these people are like, yeah, nobody said anything. I didn't, there wasn't a mandate from the pulpit, don't take the vaccine or don't you. Everybody came in because God had put something in our heart and we were witnessing to each other that something was wrong. That there was, not, there was something not of God happening and we were not going to participate in it. You remember that? It's going to be the same way. You're going to know. We're going to know. And it's going to be witnessed just like that. And I believe COVID was a test for that exact reason. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody follow me right now. Okay. So... Somebody shows up and says, I'm Elijah. And nobody's really witnessing to it. Okay, we're good. Okay. The church will face the Antichrist. I just went over that. So let's talk about the Antichrist religion. All right. What is, what is it going to look like? Could the Antichrist create an alternate Ten Commandments based on worshiping creation? Could that happen? Has that happened? Yes. Right now. And they even went up on what they thought was Mount Sinai, which it's not because you guys have learned where the real Mount Sinai is. 
they went up on the Mount Sinai, and something happened, I think, where they broke the... They broke the tap. I, I don't think, and they didn't understand what that meant. Like they're 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 judging themselves. They're they're witnessing against themselves when they broke the tablets, because that's what Moses did when they were worshiping a false god, right? Remember that golden calves. Okay, so they witnessed against themselves. All right. So do you think there could be apostasy in our current day by people who call themselves Christians? And was there Christians? That were involved in this. Christians. Yeah. Orthodox Christians. Pro Protestant Christians. They were all involved in this thing. So there, you have quite literally a fake Ten Commandments that's put out there. And it was very easily discerned, right? Okay, so. This, okay, this is what the early church fathers understood as the Antichrist religion, okay? It's called the Doctrine of Emanations. This is a Gnostic doctrine. They believed, the Gnostics did, that every human being had a little sliver of God inside of them. Like a physical sliver of God inside them, okay? And because they had that physical sliver of God inside them, they could never... Be lost. In other words, they would be once saved, always saved. That's where it came from. Okay, that is a Gnostic heresy, and they believed, and this is the lie of Satan, that God, by putting this little sliver inside of every person, the more people that were born, the more diminished God would become, until He got so diminished He could be defeated. This is making a little bit of sense now. I'm just talking theology right now, okay? So Satan believed that God was diminishing himself to such an extent that he could eventually be overcome and defeated. Except that God can't be diminished, right? And oh, by the way, there's not a sliver of God. Oh, watch this. This is so awesome. There's not a sliver of God inside of us. It's the fullness. Yeah. Whew. There, there, is, there are some huge theological implications to this idea. This is behind so much stuff. A lot of witchcraft is based in this stuff. There, there's just so much that, that comes out of this. So let me focus on just kind of one part of it. There's also a doctrine where predestination, there are certain people only that can be saved because they are predestined to be saved, and the rest are lost. This is also where that comes from. Is that Calvinism? Yes, it's Calvinism. Calvinism is based on a Gnostic heresy. That is a historic fact. I don't want to get into it today. But it is... John Calvin had to figure out a way to get around the Pope excommunicating people that disagreed with him, okay? And the way to get around it is to say, well, the Pope can't excommunicate me if I'm once saved, always saved. And that's the short version of it. And he made that argument, okay? That is way oversimplification, but that's it in a nutshell, all right? So, the Antichrist won't worship or regard Jesus Christ <coughs> or others, What's there left to worship then? And yourself and somebody somebody say creation right now. Come on, somebody. Okay. Well now and I actually ran into this on a Thanksgiving. I ruined Thanksgiving one year. Brand new Christian. Somebody said, What is anyway, somebody said What is sin? I know. And I ruined Thanksgiving. Okay, so. <laughs> short version is the person looked at me and said, I am a God. I was like, it was a family member. Like, I'm praying for you now for sure, right? Okay, but it's the, it's the natural outflow of what we just talked about, right? Antichrist will worship the God of forces. What is the God of forces? It's the 
energy in each one of the emanations and leftover energy from what was once God. In other words, we need to channel energy. And I, this is interesting, the God of forces. Star Wars fans out there. Okay. That's where it came from. Okay. There's nothing new under the sun. Now look, I personally believe Star Wars is better than Star Trek. I don't want to get into that today and cause a big, huge divide. Okay. So, all right. All right. But... The God of forces is this idea that energy can be channeled that's left over from God. It's been diffused through all these things. This is the whole center of New Age, right? What's the purpose of this? What is the purpose of this? What is the purpose of worshiping the God of forces and channeling all the energy? What's the purpose? What's that? Well, okay, but what's the... We just said... Okay, you're becoming to empower yourself. So anytime anybody's doing just things to empower themselves instead of expand the kingdom and help other people, they're like, they're just empowering themselves. They're falling into the trap of worshiping the God of forces. Because they're just, they're just I'm, I'm going to empower myself. It's just me anyway. It matters. My truth. I have my truth. You have your truth. So... There will be a claim that we will be the highest evolved being. Okay? But the Antichrist is going to say he's the highest evolved being through lying signs and wonders. Is that happening today? People trying to do that? Be the highest evolved being? Technology? transhumanism, AI, all these things, right? They're trying to be the highest evolved being. So that's telling me we're in a place, right? This is a sign. Based on the ancient Babylonian mystery religion, which is the sorcery and evil practices taught by the fallen angels. Twenty years ago, when I was a kid, I'm just joking, twenty years ago, <laughs> 20 years ago, I never would have thought I would see a Satanist, an open Satanist, taking pictures with kids kid doing blood rituals in mainstream articles, right? Never thought that would happen, right? But it's out there right now. It's out there right now. Satanism is being glorified, and, and virtually every Super Bowl halftime show is that, okay? Right? So these are signs that something is wrong. So let's talk about apostasy. Here's some of the early church fathers. So forsake teaching of the 12 apostles and their faith, their love, and their purity. They will love the office and be devoid of wisdom. Respect for persons will be um, common in those days, and such as love the honor of this world. There will be much slandering, and the Holy Spirit will depart from many, Great jealousy will prevail in the last days. So let me ask a couple of questions. Are there a lot of people even inside the church who are worried about their reputation in the world? Yes, there are. Okay. Are there people that are slandering a lot of other Christians? Yes, there are. Is the Holy Spirit departed from part of the church? Didn't they just have like a cessationist conference or something like that? Okay, so we're seeing this happen. Then there will be overturnings of, of the churches everywhere. <laughs> Did that happen? Yes, okay. The scriptures will be despised, and everywhere they will sing the songs of the... And is that not Nashville? Fornications and adulteries and perjuries will fill the land. And remember, this is written in AD 210, okay? I'm not shoehorning it in. There will be... Earthquakes in every city and plagues in every country. Man. Storms of winds will disturb both sea and land excessively. Winters. Oh, okay, now, Satan's a counterfeit, right? So if he's saying global warming, winters of excessive severity, unlooked for conflagrations, but for forest fires? Yes. Okay, watch this. Now, just again. It 
Signs of the times. Did this happen 400 years ago? Were there huge forest fires all over the place 400 years ago? Even in the 1900s, the early 1900s, there were no forest fires like this because we managed the forests. All right. Second Esdras. Not canon. This is not canon, but this is just, again, a list in there that is very interesting that gives some certain signs. Now, if a prophecy is correct, we should pay attention to it, right? And the prophecies in Second Ezra so far have been correct, right? All right, so inhabitants of the world taken in great number. I don't know what that means. Could it be death? Could it be rapture? I, I don't know what that means. Way of the truth hidden, has that happened? Land will be barren of faith. Well, not totally barren, but it's clearly some stuff that's happening. Iniquity worse than the time of the writing and pre-flood world. It's getting close to that, isn't it? Okay. Now, to be fair, in Roman times, in Greco-Roman times, they had very rampant pederasty. Gymnos, the gy where we get gym from, they would, that's what they would do there, okay? Just leave it at that. So there, there was stuff happening then, too. There was temple prostitution and all those kind of things were happening then, too. But on the scale that it's happening today, no. Persia will be laid waste. I want you to... Write that one down. I want you to write that one down and put a little star next to it, okay? All right. The sun shining at night and the moon by day. That is an odd statement. I don't know what that means. Blood will drip from the wood. Well, that's happening right now, beheadings. Stones will cry out. Nations will be troubled. Air will be changed. That's only in some manuscripts. The one whom many do not set their hopes on will rule. That's the Antichrist. Birds will migrate. Oh, that should... Sorry. Dead sea will produce fish and a sound at night. There's something interesting happening with the Dead Sea now. I showed you where it's blooming on the outside of it. Okay. There's flowers now coming, and that's a fulfillment of a prophecy in Scripture. So this is actually called out specifically. Confusion will abound. Fire will rain down. Is that nuclear war? Desert beasts will migrate from their places. Unrighteousness and the lack of self-control will multiply. That's happening. This is a very disturbing... Okay, we're going to go back to pre-flood world. Okay. Nephilim. Okay. Could that be genetic modification? I don't know. But 2nd Esdras, again, was taught, was commented on by the early church fathers. Salt water will be found in fresh. Is that happening in the Mississippi River right now? Somebody say yes. Okay, way up the Mississippi River right now. Friends will wage war with friends. So that's happening. Men will hop or hope, excuse me, but not obtain. Labor, but not prosper. How many of you feel like you're laboring but not prospering? All right. Wisdom hides itself and understanding withdraws to its secret chamber. I find that a fascinating thing that wisdom and, and understanding is withdrawing to a secret chamber, another secret place almost is what that seems to say. All right. Let's do some other ones. Okay, so remember, that is not, sorry, that is not canon, okay? Let me go to, okay, now, chapter 6, one-year-old children will speak. Premature babies at three to four months will live. This was written in 200 AD at least. The earliest version we have, it could be even earlier than that that was written. Premature babies at three to four years old or three to four months old will live. That's interesting. That, that technology did not exist until recently. Sown fields will suddenly be found unsown. Full storehouses will suddenly be found empty. Trumpet will sound scaring everyone who hears it. 
Friends will wage war with friends. Springs will stand still for three hours. Place standing shook and men will, men taken up will return in millennial reign. This is actually part of it. Earthquakes, uproar of nations, those caught up, kept safe from peril. Wow. Yeah. Have you seen on uh, uh, videos of trumpets blowing that were obviously not human? I've heard those videos. I have heard them. I, has anybody else heard those things? It's pretty well. Okay, so. Okay, 3 Corinthians. Not canon. 3 Corinthians was included in the Armenian canon. 3 Corinthians, uh, there were six Latin manuscripts. There's a Coptic manuscript. There's a Greek manuscript called the Bodmer Papri. Okay, here's the, we test everything against Scripture. There is nothing in here that goes against Scripture. But one of the very fascinating things that is in here is the teachings of the evil one being embraced in the church as a sign of the second coming of Christ is imminent. Okay? 3 Corinthians chapter 1 also has a list of heresies that will be taught in the last times. That's why I pulled it out. The Lord was not born of Mary. Who teaches that? Close. What's that? Muslims do, yes. Okay, so Jehovah Witnesses believe that Christ was an apparition or phantom, okay? Jesus was not of the line of David. We must study, or we must not study the Old Testament prophets. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you guys right now. I have heard this inside charismatic circles. And we actually ceased a relationship with somebody because they were teaching that, okay? God is not almighty. There is no resurrection of the flesh, only of the spirit. Creation is not God's work. In other words, it is the work of evolution, which some churches accept. Okay? The Lord did not come in the flesh. I'm going to be really careful here. Kenosis is the name of this. God is 100% God and 100% man when he came down here. Did he restrict himself, empty himself of himself? Yes, he did. But he was 100 and is 100% God and 100% man Okay, when he came here. Amen? So, this also is a Gnostic doctrine. The world was created by angels and not by God. Now we're getting into uh, LDS type of thing. That is Jesus really the brother of the enemy? I just, just weird stuff like that. Okay, Jesus was not crucified, but someone who looked like Jesus was crucified. This is Islam. Okay? And... Ebionite and Serinthus Gnosticism, Jesus was just a man. And then the Holy Spirit came on him, and then it came off him. He was just a man, not God. Okay? Just, again, I've really oversimplified a lot of this. But Serinthus in particular, John the, he was in Ephesus. John the Apostle walked into a bathhouse, and Serinthus was in there. And he turned around and walked out and he said, I don't want to be in the same place just in case the roof falls in on him and God executes judgment on Serinthus, this heretic. Okay? All right? So, this was an issue that John had to deal with, and this is why John wrote 1 John 1, 2, and 3. He actually wrote 1 John 3 first, which is the shortest one, because he thought that would take care of the problem of Gnostic heresy. That didn't work. So he wrote 1 John 2, and then he wrote 1 John 1, which is the longest one, to put the whole thing to bed. So if you want to hear a refutation of Gnostic heresy, those three books do that. <coughs> All right. So timeline review. My goodness. Jesus has presented Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits. Jesus fulfilled... Those feasts on the exact 
day, at the exact time, in his physical person. First trumpet, Pentecost. You hear that right now. The first trumpet is Pentecost. Okay? Jesus didn't fulfill that one. Holy Spirit did with a physical appearance as tongues of fire. Next in the timeline, the Dragon Nation Wars, Second Esdras, the invasion of Gog, Ezekiel 38, Gog destroyed. Sounds like nuclear weapons in there because there is fuel for ten or seven years based on that, but also they have to segregate everything out. Third temple, no outer courtyard is built. How long to build? Well, first temple was dedicated on the Feast of Trumpets. So if you see the first temple, or if you see the third temple dedicated on the Feast of Trumpets, start counting, right? Or at least be imminently expected. All right. Call to repentance. That's what happened before, watch this, before the Feast of Trumpets for 30 days, there is a call to repentance. What did John the Baptist do? He called to repentance, made the crooked way straight, right? It's a call to repentance, baptism, call to repentance, baptism. Now you kind of get the strategy in On Fire Ministries, call to repentance, baptism. Prepare the way of the Lord, right? 30 days of Elul was the month before Tishri, the month before the Feast of Trumpets, okay? The last day of Elul was one of the two days you didn't know the day or the hour. Now, when the Feast of Trumpets was sound, sounded, basically it stood for king, repentance, alarm, king. Watch this. King came the first time. So literally the trumpet blasts have a meaning. So they blow the trumpet. King came the first time. Repentance, alarm, wake up, he's coming a second time, and then the second one. Okay? That brings us to... There were two blessings, 30 blasts, and then tribulation, okay? One to six seals, two witnesses. Now, I want to talk about this quickly. This is the abomination, the desolation. Those are the scripture references if you want to study them. Here's potentially the scripture references of the rapture. Here's the timelines. And the seventh seal is the last trump. Well, what is the last trump? God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> so, the last trump, this is why I also believe, notice how we went to Revelation 7, that's why I also believe that in a pre-wrath rapture, because the last trump in Revelation when it said, you say the last trump, what that meant was the Feast of Trumpets. The last trump. Then there was ten days, days of awe, and then there was the great trump. That's the trump of victory on Yom Kippur. Okay? Everybody following right now? So during that time, though, okay, what are we doing? So excited about that. God's wrath is being poured out. This atonement, everybody follow me right now. Let me back up. These are trumpets. We're caught up. Everybody follow. We're caught up with him. And some people, this is why there's a, uh, an argument about this. For pre-tribulation rapture, well, you're caught up. It should be seven days, right? Seven years corresponding to seven years that we're in the presence of the Lord versus three and a half or three or whatever it ends up being. Here's what I know. It says last trump, and it means the Feast of Trumpets. We're caught up on the last trump, the Feast of Trumpets, right? We are with the Lord until what happens? The wrath passes under, and then we come down, right? And we come down, what are, what are we with? Okay, and what are we riding on? Come on, somebody say a horse. Yes. Non-horse riders out there, we are riding on a horse. 
or you poor horse riders like me out there, we are riding on a horse and I'm going to get better in Jesus' name because Cowboy Rob's going to teach me. All right, I'll leave. All right, so, so when it happens, we're, we're up. We come back down. And they're called the days of awe. We don't know when we come back down, but we do know this. What happens on Yom Kippur? What happens on Yom Kippur? What did they do on Yom Kippur? What animals? Two goats, remember? Ah! One of which is a... is the Antichrist, right? Two Azazel. All right, guys, hang on. Could it be on that day that the sheep are separated from the goats? So if that's the case, we're back down here, and Yom Kippur is the day of judgment. Everybody following? Not the great judgment, not the great white throne. It's the day of judgment. Everybody who's still on the earth, everybody who's not on the earth is down in Sheol, right? It's the day of judgment. So he separates the sheep from the goats. Everybody following me right now? And then what happens? There is a great victory trumpet because they've been defeated and separated out. I want you to think of this as we come down and all the armies are arrayed against, and there's a whole bunch of people that are killed in that battle, right? But are we killed? No. And then the good people, the good sheep, they're separated out. The goats are separated out, and then the goats are judged for their rebellion against God. Does this make sense to you? This is how it would normally happen in a war. On the Feast of Atonement, we are claiming... The covering of the blood of the Lamb, right? That's why we're with Him. But the people that are still left on the earth, they, they're also covered if they believe in Jesus Christ. And the judgment will pass over them and be executed on the wicked. Everybody following me right now? Okay. So the great trump, and you can read this in Isaiah, and the same term is used in Matthew 24, 31. And we're going to go there right now. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Watch this, though. Back up to verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Wait a minute. After the tribulation, everybody following right now, who is he gathering? This is where the great argument is. If Jesus is coming back, who's with him? So who's he gathering? He's gathering the elect. It says the elect in there, right? That can only leave one group of people, the people left on the earth still that are his elect. 
So we're coming back with him. And, and the reason I say that is because it doesn't say the last trump. It says the great trump. Everybody following me right now? So at the great trump, the sheep are gathered together. The goats are separated out and judgment is executed. Does that make sense now? Okay, the next verse, I love this stuff. The next verse says, now learn from the parable of the fig tree. <clears throat> what do figs symbolize? Nations. Nations. nations, right? The fruit of nations. You hear that right now? The fruit of nations. So now it's being judged as nations. And what does it say? The sheep and the goats are separated out. And it's implying there are sheep nations and goat nations. Everybody makes, okay, fantastic. Click, clank, all right? And he, he gives you the idea of this timing. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. As soon as its branches become tender and it sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. So too, when you see these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Heaven and earth will not pass away. My words will not pass away. I'm sorry, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day and hour, no one knows. Oh, man. There's two things being said there. If you understand Jewish history, now he's talking about the Feast of Trumpets. And he's talking about the Feast of Atonement at the end, and the symbol of that at the end. So, the Bema Seat Judgment, we've talked about that before. You can read those references there. But this is why I, I wanted to bring this up to you. This is the order in which it happens. Do we know the exact year? No, we don't know the exact year, but this is the order in which things happen, and the order in which things happen matters. Okay, so... There are going to be people left on this earth who are not going to be glorified because they give their lives to Jesus after the rapture and they actually endured his wrath. Okay? All right. If that's the case, then those people have to be given a choice to choose Jesus or not, right? Some of them will choose Jesus then. Some of them will not. But all of them are judged. All of them are separated out, right? When they have children, because they're still on the earth, and if Jesus is ruling and reigning on the earth, are people going to live longer? I would think so. I think that's a really, if the healer himself is on the earth, ruling and reigning, I think that that's a good theological rock to stand on, okay? So if that's the case and they live longer, their children have to have a choice to choose Jesus or not, right? And if that's the case, then Satan has to be loosed at the end of the thousand years so that they have a choice to choose Jesus or not, and then everything is consummated and done. Does that make sense? So that's the end. That's the story. And then the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Shimon and the were with him in eternity, the day of eternity. It's all symbolized through that. So Jesus tabernacles with us on the earth. And then at the end, there's the day of eternity. Whew. All right. We're going to do one more today. Let's go to Revelation 8. If you guys are up for it. If you're not. Okay. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add to it, or add it to, the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense ascended from the angel's hand with the prayers of the saints before God. Then the angel took the censer 
and filled it with the fire of the altar and hurled it to the earth. And there were peals of thunder and flashes and lightning and an earthquake. This very clearly looks like when the wrath starts. Okay? And then, or so, and the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. The first sounded, and there was hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was hurled into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The star is named Wormwood, and a third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died from the waters because they were made bitter. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. Then I looked and heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who live on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Now, before this, the only action of God is to break seals. This is direct action. Now, some of these things I love this. He comes in his people before he comes for his people. The persecution, the affliction, tribulation is ended. Now wrath, passion, judgment, and vengeance is poured out. First trumpet, hail and fire mixed with blood, great burning mountain, great burning star, sun, moon, and star struck. Some people say this is symbolic of the fallen angel. All right. This seems very clear it was hurled to the earth, right? So it's not talking about a spiritual thing anymore. It's hurled to the earth. There's going to be direct consequences on the earth. Great burning mountain, could be a meteorite, could be a comet. It doesn't matter, does it? It's wrath. Right? And by the way, it matches some of the things that happened in Egypt, doesn't it? So if this is wrath right here, we're not here on the earth if we're in Jesus and Jesus is in us. I, we can have an argument about what it might be, but why do I care? If I'm in him and he's in me, I'm above the wrath. Amen? I don't ever want this to happen to me, and I want it to be a motivator so it never happens to anybody else I love or know. Amen? All right, that's really it in a nutshell for Revelation 8. <laughs> Don't be that guy, right? <laughs> Amen? And make it a motivator that you're going out there right now, okay? But you see the, the clear depiction of wrath beginning then, boom, and then coming to the earth, all right? I see... Revelation chapter 6, as what God is doing through the tribulation that also protects his people. So yes, there are things that are, there's judgment that's coming, but there's also the protection of his people during that time. Because judgment is passing over. Does that make sense? Now it's all judgment, right? It is all happening all at one time to everybody on the earth, okay? Okay. Just like the flood. Was there tribulation for Noah? Yeah. We can argue about what all that was, but there was tribulation for Noah. God protected him through it, and then the wrath came. Amen? So that brings us to chapter 8. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude, and I'll take questions. Um, but first, Father, we thank you for tonight. Seal these things in our hearts, Lord, and help us to just stay focused on you, that we live in one of the most amazing times in history, if not the most amazing time in history. 
And Lord, I thank you that you put us here right now and that we can rest assured on your rock that you provide for your people, that you cover us in your blood, and that we will not be shaken, that you have not appointed us for wrath, but Lord, that you right now are working to turn all things to good for those who love you, who are called according to your purpose, and Lord God, your sons and daughters, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so questions, please. We're not be shooken. Verse 3 of 7. It says, uh, the angel was yelling at the other angels, and he's like, do not harm the earth, do or the sea, or the trees. Why does he signify the trees then? Because aren't they part of the earth? They are, but what do the trees produce? Well, they produce CO2. Yeah, and they breathe CO2, so that means climate change. All right. It actually, if you go back to Genesis, it's, yeah, you follow on. All right, what, that's good. What, up, what else? You know that Matthew 24 you're talking about? Yeah. The great tribulation ends. Then what did you say was the timeline? And I didn't quite get all of it. So the great tribulation ends, and then it sounds like wrath after that, but then it says that we come back. You, you follow me right now, Wayne? Okay. So there's a, there's a last trump, which is the Feast of Trumpets. We're caught up. God's wrath sweeps underneath. We come back down, and then there's judgment. That's about as simple as I can make it. After the Great Tribulation, before His wrath. We're caught. Yep. Okay. It's pre-wrath is the best way that I can describe it. Because it, there's not a timeline. It's not tied to an event as much as it's tied to when His wrath is poured out. Yep. Okay. It's more consistent, at least for me, in Scripture to, to take that approach. I know I go through a lot, guys, and I know some of you like just... <laughs> but, I'm off, I'm off. but here's here's the thing. That's how deep his, his word is. And there's even more. There's even more. Okay. Go ahead. This goes back to Revelation six and the four horses that are coming. Okay. Down. Yep. Who's on those horses? Well, who do they represent? I mean, they say famine and and who, who's. Um, I was so, reading in, so, in, in Zechariah today, and, and it talks about those. Yep. So who are the people? Are there, they're not people, they're only representatives? It's, represent, it's representing angels on patrol. It, yeah. It's just the angels? Yeah. Okay. But they could be riding on horses. I mean, if we're riding on horses, angels could ride on horses too. It's, it's <coughs> By the way, that means there's animals in heaven. Just, I, I don't want to get into a big theological thing about that. There's an eagle. There's horses. All right. There's only one cat. It's the Lion of Judah. There it is. Yeah, it's just, it's just not... Okay, so watch this, all right? Where does New Jerusalem come down to? From? Okay, so God wants to redeem his entire creation, so the Edenic vision was that there would be dogs and cats, right? And, and we would be here in our glorified bodies, right? Because that's where Adam was. God wants to restore us back to that? There have to be animals there, because Adam named them. Yeah, meat eating only happened after the flood. Right. 
Did, now there is one animal. Now this is this is the homework extra credit assignment. There was one animal. One animal that is eaten at the wedding feast according to Jewish tradition. I've already taught on it. One creature that is eaten at the wedding feast. Close. It's close. Right. Who, who said Leviathan? Leviathan. Yep. <laughs> By the way, you guys see that thing with Tyson? You didn't see that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. So Tyson bought Protix, which is this gigantic oh, insect. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to investigate insect protein, right? Yeah. I'm telling you right now, that there, have been, there, there was a rebellion over whiskey at the start of the country. In the 1990s, they tried to tax beer. There was a huge outcry against that. I can't imagine if they tried to take people's steaks and hamburgers. Man, I... They've Americans been. might actually wake totally up, you know? Wow. All right, any other questions? So after the big wrath, after the wrath, after that last part, when, when God is hailing down all that stuff, will there be people still being able to be saved? Yeah, well, there's people that are still surviving, so yeah. They're still surviving. Yeah. So doing with Jesus? We're not here. Oh, no, we're... We're with him. Yeah, we're with him. When he comes back to reign and rule... We're coming with him. We're, we're coming, coming with him. him. Mm -hmm. To gather. Yep. Yeah? Well, we're yep. coming with him to gather the elect from... Well, the angels are going to gather. Where we're coming we to rule reign. Where do we put the people we gather? In cities. There's going to still be nations afterwards. See, the Lord of the Rings, the elves, are supposed to represent the immortals living with the mortals, which is Revelation. And the early church fathers taught all this, that there would be mortals living with immortals. Okay, I got you. Yeah. That's it. Very simply, anyway. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, did, I mean, he's coming back. We're going to rule and reign with him. Depending on how, how well we've used our talents is how well... Or how many cities we were given to rule over, or what areas we're given to rule over? I don't know if you guys. All right, I, I'm going to totally digress. Do you guys know the difference between Jägermeister and Burgermeister? Yeah. Huh. Do you know what it means in German? Yes. Some of you don't go back to that pre-Christian time, okay? With the Jägermeister, all right? It actually has a German has a German meaning. Jägermeister was the forest master. Burgermeister was the city master. I don't know if it's going to be a similar breakdown in God's kingdom, but there you go. Okay. Okay. All right. <coughs> what other questions do you have? You have a question. Go ahead. No. Mark. No. All right. There was so much information. I thought I'm going to go home and uh, rework my theology. But I, 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 I always thought that the same thing that uh, right at the middle of three and a half years, we would, I believe that would be the rapture we take out before wrath. A lot of those stuff in between was uh, good information. And uh, uh, as I was going to say, sometimes I need to sit down and take a break. It's, I think when we, we go exactly three and a half years, I think some, you know, I think we get kind of in it's, it's the order. I, I like to focus on the order in which things happen because you can't get messed up, right? Yeah. So if, if, if they had been paying attention, the order in which things happen is Jesus comes, he is sacrificed like a lamb, then he conquers, and then he rises as the first fruits, and then the Holy Spirit is released. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? If, if we can understand that, well, he's laid out these, these feasts, so this is happening in order. There's a feast of trumpets, we're in his presence, feast of atonement, we're back down, we're judging, there's sifting, separation. Jesus then tabernacles with us on the earth, and then at the end of the thousand years, there's the day of eternity. Yeah. I mean, it just makes sense to me. And we're not appointed for his wrath. And every single time, he took his people out of wrath. In, in Ezekiel 9 in Jerusalem, 
he uses the image of wheat being sifted with Noah and the flood. Every single time his people are, are saved, Egypt, the judgment passes over and then they're delivered out. Every single time. Didn't mean that it wasn't a storm. Didn't mean there wasn't a gigantic army behind them. Okay. But he always delivered them out. And I love it because Noah, he used the mechanism of the wrath to also deliver his people. So he walks up to the sea, Moses does. And he walks through the sea, and the sea. Yeah. Yeah. Follow? It's really interesting. And when the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem, it was through the Babylonians that the Isra Israelites were actually saved, ultimately. Yeah. And God actually spoke to the Babylonians. You know, that's interesting, too. They were a, a pagan nation, but God spoke to it holds true through history. The Holocaust, the Nazis in Germany, it was through that that Israel became a nation. I mean, each time you kind of see this. <clears throat> yeah. So if you have a mechanism in your life by which, okay, enemy is trying to really come at you, that very likely is the mechanism by which God wants to deliver you. That's very profound for whoever needs to hear that. Okay? Like I was trapped in Bible. Trapped at the end, right? Trapped. Enemy had me in a corner. But it was through that that I could walk into the calling God had for me. Amen? I think it just holds true for all of our lives. <clears throat> all right. Any other questions? Go ahead. Your hesitation was just long enough. Apophis. What's that? Apophis. Apophis. NASA has cited oh. Apophis, <laughs> which means something like destruction. Destroyer, yeah. Destroyer. Yeah. Coming towards Earth. Yeah. They say it's going to miss. Yeah. But come closer than anything has. You say that like every three years. I, I know. So every, every three years, there's something. That's and then, they, then they release a Bruce Willis movie of him going on an island. You know. I, I, I'm just doing what God's got me doing. Let's do it. Depending. Any other? There's been so much about like wormwood. What does that mean? Again. Okay. Everything before this, I'm really paying attention to, right? If I start seeing these signs and that's. Okay. Everybody kind of get my heart on that. The Lord, the Lord wants us to be just secure in our salvation. He wants us to be secure in it. We're going to know. And just like COVID, where everybody kind of knew something was wrong. They couldn't put their finger on but they knew. They had a little churning in their heart. Now, I just, I'm not going to take the vaccine. There's something wrong here. I just, I don't know what it is. I just feel it in my heart. Hey, what do you think? Yeah, man, I'm feeling it too. What do you think? Yeah, I'm feeling it too. You come to church and everybody's like not wearing masks. And they're like, Fantastic. I'm in the right place. Okay. Just know that that's the kind of, it's going to be the body together witnessing to these things, right? As soon as you saw the war in Israel, what did you think? I, I, I'm looking, <laughs> right? And everybody felt that, right? I'm looking up. Wow. Uh, the Bible is a living, breathing word. 
it tells you that it's going to happen before this generation passes. Amen. Okay. Any other questions? That was good. All right. If you want to stay after, I'll talk about Ben and Zai. Okay. God bless you guys. And have a good night. I hope you are winterized. <laughs>